let's see now what is what we are going to look at uh, today here to date what has happened in the forex market in uh, other asset markets and then we are going to look at what has happened in the major economies in the big economies such as the united states the eurozone japan the uk then a little bit about australia and china and a couple of things about commodities i know a lot of people are very interested in gold but crude oil also and then we are going to have a summary of uh, what's happening going forward and some ideas for you so so far what has happened well we have a, a strong us dollar the dollar has been strong across the board its strength has been matched only by the yen despite some uh, recent uh, falls by the yen in recent weeks so this is a more than three percent gain for the dollar index uh, more than three percent uh, gain the, the dollar index is uh, a basket of uh, six major currencies the euro is very heavily weighted into the dollar index and Basically, the dollar has gone up against uh, this basket, but against each and every one of these currencies as well. The commodity currencies, which are the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, and the New Zealand dollar, the Looney, the Aussie, and the Kiwi, have taken the biggest hit. They are down roughly around 5% since the beginning of the year against the dollar. The pound was a little worse than the euro, so... Uh, maybe you know the pound is being affected by brexit fears but they didn't cause as much relative damage because if it was if brexit fears were so intense the pound would also be down a lot against the euro and it wasn't so you can see here the dollar has gone up against the canadian dollar the aussie has fallen the kiwi has also fallen the yen generally you see the yen crosses uh, except for dollar yen they are negative so the yen has done also relatively well so and the dollar index you see is going up 3.3 percent and the swiss franc dollar swissy actually uh, swiss franc also a bit down on the year then we look at stocks stocks are positive but not all of them are uh, positive not all markets developed and uh, the United States stock markets are up around four to five percent they are doing much better than emerging market stocks which are down uh, in the region of two to three percent and Asian stocks maybe this is a little bit related to trade wars we'll talk a little bit more about that later crude oil is the best performer but other commodities are not doing so well and U.S. bond yields, so this is more or less the interest rate, let's say the long-term interest rates, are sharply higher. The 10-year U.S. long-term interest rate is up about 0.4% or 42 basis points. Wood yields are up, but less so. So you can see here oil up very strongly. Brent crude not as strong a performance, but you see here copper, silver, soft commodities, and gold. So you see that commodities are both the worst performers over here in terms of gold, soft commodities. These are agricultural commodities. Soft commodities are things like wheat, uh, soya beans, uh, coffee, sugar, and uh, sil silver and copper doing badly, whereas oil has been doing relatively well. You see here the S&P 500, the U.S. stock market up almost 5% developed markets around 4.3%. On to the U.S. economy. GDP growth in the U.S. has slowed to 2% in the first quarter, but we are expecting a surge in the second quarter. It could go up to 4%, the annualized rate in the second quarter we are going to get those figures on friday so uh, this will be something uh, very interesting uh, to watch this uh, acceleration in uh, growth is happening because uh, 
we can see that um, we have the Trump uh, tax cuts, especially the corporate uh, tax cuts, but other tax cuts as well for uh, uh, the middle class in the US. So this is helping uh, growth and uh, consumer spending, investment, etc. Inflation hit a six and a half year high of 2.9% in June. This was mostly because of high oil prices though. It wasn't so much because core inflation is around 2.3% and the Fed's target measure of inflation is 2%. So inflation, yes, it's up, but nothing so scary just yet. Unemployment rate, very, very low, 3.8%, the lowest in 18 years. Uh, that was in May. It bounced back to 4% during June. Wage growth is relatively moderate. It's around 2.7%. So this, there's no huge urgency for the Fed to uh, raise rates. It is uh, following this uh, gentle path of uh, rate hikes. And we'll see whether high oil prices as well as trade tensions are going to limit the positive impact of uh, Trump's uh, fiscal stimulus. I would add to that list, of course, uh, higher interest rates because interest rates have been going up in the United States. Here you see uh, average earnings, and this is uh, core inflation. So uh, what, what does this mean? It means that uh, workers in the United States are enjoying some uh, wage gains over and above core inflation. And that core inflation is not so high right now. Neither are, is wage growth, by the way. And you see here unemployment and the non-farm payrolls in blue. These are the business confidence uh, numbers. The green one is for non-manufacturers or services, and the blue one is for manufacturers. And you see that they are doing relatively well. They have been uh, climbing since 2016, and they are near their uh, recent highs, the uh, highs of the last uh, uh, six years at least. Now, of course, uh, politics is a very important uh, factor uh, for the for when we are talking about the United States. Why? Because we uh, have the 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 threat of uh, tariffs. Not actually, no, not only the threat, but the imposition of tariffs by uh, the US administration. So this has caused uh, retaliation in the case of uh, China and uh, Europe. And now we are going to get a second round. We might get a second round rather of tariffs by the US government. This may lead to further, so this tit for tat may lead to a trade war, make it out of hand a little trade war, which can be damaging for the global economy. However, uh, these, um, trade uh, restrictions are fairly popular with the US electorate. So it doesn't look like uh, Trump is going to stop with his theme uh, until the midterm elections in November. So this, since it is popular politically, he may try to extend it. But at the same time, he has to be careful not to cause too serious a stock market a decline by ratcheting up these measures very quickly and uh, causing investor confidence to fall. So it will be interesting uh, to watch that. And also we have some more tension because uh, European allies are also, uh, Trump's European allies are also uh, have issues with him, uh, etc. The Fed. It has hiked uh, twice this year by 0.25%, and we may get uh, two more rate hikes, one in uh, September and maybe one in December. Now we have a 60% probability of getting a, another rate hike in uh, December. Now, within the FOMC, it's not so clear cut whether we're going to get four rate hikes because uh, some members are predicting uh, two more, so that would make two until now, plus two, four. Some are predicting just one more. 
So it's going to be interesting what is going to play, how it's going to play out. Uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, he was relatively upbeat by the, for the U.S. economy's uh, prospects, so he's not so worried. Uh, there is some worry, though, that we have a flattening uh, yield curve. So this is a sign that the U.S. could be heading for a slowdown, but there is this huge debate whether this uh, technical uh, indicator is... I'm not talking about technical analysis indicator. I'm talking like this specialized indicator which shows the difference between long-term and short-term rates, whether it is going to be uh, as significant as it has been in the past. Here you see the yield spread for the past uh, 14, 15 years. It's relatively low, and you see that oh, this is a low yield spread is and uh, generally associated with the recession, and this is the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis. Here you see the dollar index. After bottoming out in April, it has built up uh, quite uh, hefty gains, but you see it uh, having some trouble to break uh, this uh, 95 and a half more or less barrier. On to the Eurozone. The Eurozone generally is uh, slowing down a little bit, so uh, we have 0.4% uh, quarter on quarter in first quarter from 0.7%. This might have been due to cold weather, but also we are seeing that the, the PMIs or the business confidence uh, surveys are pointing towards a slowdown. Relative slow now. Still, we have positive growth. Things are not that bad, but uh, it's not a runaway economy for sure in the Eurozone. Inflation, uh, headline inflation is 2%, but again, this is driven by higher oil prices. You remember, we saw a few slides ago that oil was the best performing uh, asset uh, year to date. So this, of course, translates into higher oil energy prices, higher gasoline prices, etc. Underlying inflation, the core inflation is 0.9% in June. That is really low, and that is really uh, preventing the ECB from removing uh, stimulus more quickly, because if inflation goes down even more, it could uh, be associated with deflation. Euro area unemployment is relatively low for Europe. It's at 8.4%, but, you know, this... Uh, Unemployment rate is not uh, is not very high by European standards. I think north of 10% could be a high, high unemployment rate. And we have the Eurozone business surveys pointing to further deterioration in sentiment. But it's still above 50. 50 is the expansion contraction line, so... Uh, North of 50 is good, even though, you know, 52 is worse than 55, but it's still expansion. We have uh, this trade uncertainty hitting uh, Europe, and this is uh, a problem uh, for sure, more than other countries because it's a relatively open economy. You see headline, this is effect of oil driving inflation higher, but core inflation not uh, so high. And you see this deterioration in business confidence the composite PMI has fallen from around 59 to 55 right now. The ECB is, has reduced its uh, asset purchase program or quantitative easing. Uh, now uh, asset purchases are going to halve to 15 billion from October and they are going to end in December. However, uh, the markets are not so thrilled, at least uh, the euro fell on this news. Why? Because uh, the ECB promised uh, not to touch interest rates uh, until the end of the summer of 2019. So that's a fairly important promise that is going to keep interest rates at uh, zero. Deposit rates are negative right now, and uh, they're going to stay there for one more year. So now the market is anticipating maybe a slight interest rate increase at the end of uh, next year. 
Political woes are still uh, something uh, to worry about in uh, Europe. We have uh, the anti-establishment parties in Italy, the, the Five Star Movement and the Northern League. They are in a coalition government. It was a bit rocky at the beginning. Uh, these two, though, managed to find a way to communicate that they are interested in uh, stability, let's say, and uh, not exiting the euro anytime soon, which is something that was uh, worrying uh, some investors. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, some uh, hiccups also. We saw the on Friday this uh, talk that uh, they had a, a row with the finance minister over who was going to be appointed at some state-owned bank. So you see that there is some nervousness still. The market doesn't completely trust these two uh, anti-establishment parties uh, coalition government. Angela Merkel is also a little bit uh, weak because uh, she is getting uh, some uh, criticism, intense criticism for uh, the immigrant, uh, the migration issue in uh, Europe. So uh, some of her allies would like to see a tougher line by Europe. EU is also under attack on uh, trade and on NATO. Uh, Trump is going to be threatening with uh, Europe with tariffs. He also wants European nations to raise their defense spending. So politically not the best situation for. And here you see since April, uh, the euro has uh, climbed down rather significantly and is in more or less, I guess the dollar is more or less in a range of 115 to 118. This range has been in place for the past uh, three months or so. So it's very exciting to see what is going to happen uh, after that. Probably a resumption of the downward uh, trend, but we will see about that. Next, we go to Japan. Japan had a nasty first quarter when the economy contracted by 0.6%. We should get positive growth in second quarter, although we could also, it's not impossible, we get some negative growth. Inflation in Japan is low, it's around 1% core CPI, core inflation. So it really doesn't let, leave much space for the Bank of Japan to uh, normalize uh, policy, although there were some rumors today that they are thinking of uh, making some adjustments uh, to their uh, monetary policy and asset purchases. So we'll see. The next Bank of Japan meeting is uh, next Monday and Tuesday in a week's time. Unemployment rate uh, very low, but uh, growth, wage growth, eh, at 1.3%, it's nothing to write uh, back home about. Still positive, I mean, better than inflation, but uh, this is not really a wage growth that uh, can boost uh, consumer spending significantly. Now, the weaker yen is helping, for sure, but Japan is a very uh, open to trade. It's a net exporter, so trade tensions could uh, create problems there. So here you see positive export growth. You see the slowdown in uh, GDP. You see consumer spending has been uh, suffering in 2018, not uh, very good, and inflation around uh, below 1%. The Bank of Japan is uh, nowhere near its uh, stimulus exit door. Uh, so inflation remains uh, subdued and it has actually given up trying to predict when inflation is going to reach uh, 2%, its target. Because it's so many times uh, the Bank of Japan has got this wrong, it just stopped uh, trying to do and just saying that, uh, you know, it used to say that next year we're going to reach the 2% target, said this year after year after year, it never reached the 2% target, so now it's given up on this. The Bank of Japan is uh, the last of the major central banks uh, to end its QE program. So this is probably weighing on the yen for sure. Uh, we have seen some improving uh, improvement in uh, wage growth, but 
uh, higher inflation difficult difficult to see where high inflation is going to come from and you see uh, the yen going to around 104 uh, dollar yen dollar has strengthened against the yen to around uh, 113, 113.4, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. But it's a thing we have seen uh, uh, dollar yen backing down a little bit, correction in the dollar yen rate. Now, the UK also has suffered a slowdown during uh, 2018. We have uh, two drivers of this slowdown, weaker consumer spending, because of income squeeze, basically what is happening there is that inflation is uh, relatively high and this is eating up all the wage increases of UK households. So UK households not feeling uh, very uh, uh, very rich with the money that they are uh, receiving, that they are getting paid. And also we have lower business spending, we have Brexit uncertainty, this is hitting investment uh, a little bit. Second quarter, real incomes have started to rise again as inflation has backed down. This is helping uh, household. Uh, despite the slower growth, UK labor market is strong. Uh, uh, unemployment is at a four decade low, 4.2%, but uh, wage growth still relatively low at 2.5%. Uh, okay, it's higher relative to other countries, but when you see that inflation is uh, around 2.4 percent doesn't leave much uh, scope for uh, uh, real i.e inflation adjusted uh, uh, wage growth we are expecting second quarter uh, better fate for the, uh, the uk economy and we are wondering whether uh, the bank of england is going to raise interest rates in uh, in august in around 10, day, 10 days time, if I'm not mistaken. Now, you see the blue line and the yellow and the orange line, inflation and wage earnings. Uh, one is tracking very, the other very closely. And retail sales, uh, you see the post-Brexit, they were very high, but then we are starting to see uh, this drop off And you can see uh, market uh, services and manufacturing doing relatively well. It's not bad uh, what is happening here. Now, key for the UK is what is happening with Brexit. Not much progress to report on uh, Brexit talks uh, since spring. The Northern Irish border has not been uh, resolved. There are divisions and tensions within uh, Prime Minister May's uh, party about this. May is pushing for a softer Brexit. It wants some kind of customs arrangement with the EU. However, we don't see uh, the UK's massive services sector uh, being part of the common of the single market. So this could be a, a big hit to the UK economy. This proposal by May uh, led to the resignation of the Brexit Secretary David Davis and Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. So one wonders uh, when these uh, fairly senior figures may uh, turn against uh, May and uh, try to unseat her. So there is speculation of that. Although for now, she, her, uh, her government is continuing, has, a, has avoided to suffer any major defeats, partly because of uh, backing from uh, the opposition, though some op opposition MPs that uh, chose to back the government who were in favor of Brexit. The EU has uh, sort of kept quiet, not really said a lot concerning the UK's latest proposal. And uh, this uh, idea about a no-deal Brexit is a fairly serious uh, scenario to consider. Now, the Bank of England, it could uh, raise interest rates uh, at its August 2 meeting, but it's of the one and done variety. What do we mean by that? It's going to raise rates uh, in August 2nd and then just leave rates there for the foreseeable future. Uh, 
So the Bank of England has to watch whether Brexit uncertainty is going to uh, further damage uh, business investment in the UK. And uh, for a pickup in growth, uh, Brexit deal is uh, necessary, although we have said that a, a no deal is actually uh, a strong possibility as well. And here you see the pound after picking around uh, 143, uh, it has fallen, uh, crossing below the 130 mark, the key 130 psychological level against the dollar. But of course, this was also because of dollar strength. If we watch against uh, the euro, yes, there have been uh, gains of the euro versus the pound, but not as significant. So. The euro has climbed, but not uh, not dramatically so. On to Australia. Strong GDP growth in the first quarter. A rebound in export, but you know uh, a perennial problem for Australia is the high debt levels, high household debt. This is making the economy a little bit more risky. Uh, has quite leveraged uh, the Australian households. Annual inflation was, uh, and this, this leverage, by the way, is also a factor when the RBA is considering, Reserve Bank of Australia is considering higher interest rates. It could uh, drive uh, debt repayment, debt payments higher, and this could uh, create a, a serious problem for the economy. Uh, annual inflation is around 1.9%. It has been below 2% for the past two years, so no urgency in raising rates in Australia. Uh, employment is not doing uh, badly. Unemployment rate at 5.4%, not a bad unemployment rate. And Australian dollar has been on a downtrend for much of the year. We saw at the beginning of the presentation that uh, it's one of the worst performers against the US dollar. Why is that? We have somewhat slower growth in China and rising uh, trade tensions between the US and uh, China. And China is uh, Australia's uh, biggest, biggest export partner. And of course, the Aussie is sensitive to risk. The RBA is uh, not planning on raising uh, rates anytime soon. It has, in fact, uh, kept rates at a record low of 1.5% since August 2016. Uh, so it's going to be uh, two years since uh, we, that we are stuck at this uh, low rate. And we really don't expect any rate hike. So the Aussie not really getting a lot of uh, boost from the from monetary policy, because uh, the Reserve Bank is worried about what's going to happen to the economy. They're worried about a potential trade war. This could hit Chinese growth. Chinese growth uh, falls. Demand for Australian exports is going to drop uh, quite a lot. So uh, I think it's uh, safe to say that uh, no move is expected to from the RBA. And uh, we expect uh, low rates to stay beyond uh, until November 2019. So that's more than a year ago. So what that, this is what the market is, uh, is expecting. You see the Australian economy not doing uh, that badly, but some uncertainty and worries about the trade war. And you can see the Aussie uh, falling from the 80 cents uh, level to now around uh, 70, 73, 74 mark. On to China. Chinese currency not as well traded, but uh, you know it's the second largest economy in the world. Uh, economic growth slowed to 6.7 percent in uh, uh, the second quarter. The government is trying to deleverage the economy to get rid of some of the excess debt that is, uh, especially limit the uh, shadow banking uh, practices, so uh, lending which is outside the official uh, uh, channels. 
there is also a fight against uh, pollution in uh, in China, which has been a, a big problem. But we may get more sustainable and higher quality growth there. Inflation is uh, not so big a problem. It's under 2%, but uh, producer prices are a little bit uh, higher. I think maybe oil also having something to do with that. Now, the People's Bank of China, there is a speculation whether uh, whether it wants to weaken uh, the yuan or uh, the country's currency because it, it, did, it has not been raising rates in tandem with, uh, with the Fed. Now, this is uh, it's difficult to draw any conclusions so far because the dollar has been getting stronger against uh, almost every currency, so it's going to get stronger against the Chinese Yuan as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, a weaker Yuan could be one... Uh, let's say, quote-unquote, weapon that the Chinese uh, have, uh, as long as they don't overdo it, because uh, if there is a dramatic fall in confidence in the yuan, that could be a, a huge problem. So, something to watch, and the yuan has plunged to uh, one-year lows, and this has hurt confidence in uh, Chinese uh, stocks as well. Now, the biggest threat to China's economy is a potential trade war with the U.S. because uh, China runs a trade surplus and uh, the uh, Trump administration wants China to come up with a plan to reduce it. Whether that's possible or not, it's a big debate and how is that would be possible because uh, if China is more efficient at uh, making some things rather than the United States and is making them cheaper, I don't see how uh, if it's going to be easy for the U.S. to substitute uh, what China is making with domestic goods or even to increase its exports. But anyway, that's a, a different story. So we have these uh, trade uh, tariffs uh, against China, China retaliating, and of course the U.S. is importing a lot more goods from China, so they have a lot more goods on which to put uh, tariffs on. Maybe, though, the Chinese have other ways uh, to fight this war. It doesn't have to be only with uh, goods. It can be with uh, market access. It can be with uh, the yuan, we said. Uh, so it, it could get uh, very messy. And this is a risk for the global economy and the global markets as a whole. Uh, the Chinese stock market has uh, taken a big hit. It's down about 15% year to date. It's one of the worst performing stock markets on worries about what's going to happen with uh, this uh, trade uh, dispute between uh, China and the US. And still we have this deleveraging uh, theme in uh, China. Now, uh, Manufacturing PMI is not so bad in China so far. It's been holding the blue line. And the GDP, yes, it has slowed down, but really, I mean, 7 to 8% growth was not really sustainable anyway. So, and you see the yuan now, it's around 6.8. So, one US dollar buying 6.8 Chinese yuan. And this we could see uh, going up to seven. There is uh, some speculation about that. So it will be interesting to watch. On to commodities. Now, uh, we have uh, crude oil. They hit fresh three and a half years highs in, uh, in second quarter. Uh, WTI was above 75 and Brent surpassed $80 a barrel. Now, since then, WTI has dropped back to around 67, 68 today. <clears throat> so what, what's the story uh, behind that? Well, it seems that we had a series of supply disruptions and outages. We had uh, Libya 
uh, Libyan production going down. We had Venezuela production worries about that also, Holly. We have worries that Iran is not going to be able to export its oil uh, after the US has imposed uh, quite a lot of sanctions. It's going to reimpose sanctions on it and it's trying to stop countries from buying Iranian oil. So all these uh, worries uh, have uh, combined to push the price up. Now, of course, there has been a deal between the OPEC and non-OPEC uh, countries, chief among uh, our uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, to increase uh, supply. However, it seems that uh, there is not that much a spare a supply in the market for now. So uh, this is driving prices higher and is looking relatively bullish for oil. We'll have to see whether you know, there are new sources of uh, supply, but uh, shale oil also not increasing, the supply not also not increasing so much uh, in the US. So that is uh, very interesting. You see that uh, analysts are confident that, uh, okay, maybe they will drift a little bit uh, lower, but uh, they will keep stay at uh, high levels according to the Reuters poll. And this is the U.S. production. It's now around uh, 11 million uh, barrels uh, per day. So we'll see whether the uh, uh, oil producers in the U.S. can uh, ratchet up their production even more. Gold uh, has had a bad year so far. It's down about... Uh, 6%. Uh, why is uh, gold uh, down given uh, so much uncertainty is a valid uh, question, but we have had uh, uh, easing geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and, the, and in the Korean uh, Peninsula, and at the same time rising U.S. interest rates and higher uh, treasury yields, so long-term rates, are hitting demand for gold because uh, gold does not yield any interest. So uh, the opportunity cost for holding gold goes up as interest rates uh, go up as well. Now, if this uh, trend uh, persists and we also have a, a stronger US dollar and a stronger US dollar gold is denominated in dollars, so it uh, pushes uh, the price down as uh, dollar gets stronger it could break below the psychologically important 1200 level. So uh, we see, but for gold to rally, we really need a, a crisis maybe, like a global crisis, maybe a stock market crash, uh, maybe serious uncertainty in the US or elsewhere. And but given that these things are not happening and uh, you know, the world is, uh, life is, goes on as normal, let's say, uh, gold is not uh, going to have a good time given that uh, the Fed is going to keep raising interest rates. So uh, you see in 2018, gold uh, tried a few times to break through 1350, failed that, now it's all the way down and it might test this low of uh, 2017 between the 1200 level, so it's going to be an interesting ride for gold, although the trend is down. Now, summary. I hope I, I haven't, uh, it hasn't been tiring, uh, so, but we are very near the end, so if you have uh, patience for a few more minutes, please. What can we say, given everything that we have covered so far? The US dollar's fortunes, especially since April, have improved a lot. Why? Because the Fed keeps on tightening and the US is not being hit as badly from trade wars as other countries. For now, this is the... Now, why would you say this? I mean, isn't the Trump administration the one who is starting uh, most of the trade wars? Yes, it is, but uh, 
Europe is the the share of exports in GDP for Europe is much higher. The share of exports for China is much higher. The share of exports for Japan is much higher. So the U.S. is relatively closed economy. It doesn't trade, even though it it's a it's a huge economy. It doesn't trade so much with the rest of the world compared to other countries. So I'm not saying that you know U.S. trade is a small deal. No, but I'm saying relative to the size of the economy it's not as important when we are comparing to the rest of the countries which are have a much more they are much more integrated in terms of trade to the global economy what happened to the euro well the euro has lost its momentum it had positive momentum at the beginning of the year why we had a dovish ecb it has promised not to hike rates for more than a year uh, ahead we have also had some economic slowdown. We have had some political troubles. We have some mistrust about the government in Italy, what is going to happen there. We have Angela Merkel, who is in effect the de facto leader of the Eurozone, is uh, also uh, having to uh, fight just to stay alive and to survive. So uh, we have uh, some political troubles there. The yen is looking weaker in uh, medium term, but we must not forget the safe haven quality of the yen. We must not forget how hard the yen rallies when there is uh, turbulence in the global economy, when stocks are crashing. So if negative things happen, the yen could go much, much higher. But for now, uh, given that the Bank of Japan is still going to go on with its huge money printing uh, project and asset purchases, the yen is going to weaken. The pound, for sure, is very volatile. It has given up a lot of ground on uh, Brexit worries. Its mm, Brexit negotiations are not progressing very well. There is, on top of that, political instability in the United Kingdom because it's very difficult for the Conservative Party to formulate a common position. Uh, the people who are in favor of Brexit, they don't want anything to do with the European Union after uh, the Britain departs. But the people who were against Brexit want uh, ties that are close as possible. So uh, this is it's very hard to find a compromise. And May has to walk a very Prime Minister May has to walk a very fine uh, line. And uh, sometimes it's impossible to walk this line. Commodity currencies. Aussie, Looney, Kiwi, they are taking a major hit. Trade war concerns, we said. If you know there is some grand accord about trade, these, uh, these uh, currencies could rally. But absent such an accord, which does, it's not on the cards, not something that we see, I'm just saying the conditions under which these uh, currencies are going to bounce back. But absent these, uh, you know, trade uh, fears uh, going uh, dissipating, then they are going to be under pressure. Stocks are still doing well, especially developed, but we have we are seeing some uh, worrying signs. Valuation is getting high. The number of stocks getting higher is also uh, very low. Uh, what I mean by that, it's mainly the the fangs that are driving stocks are higher. The fangs are Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Google. So these kinds of stocks are the ones that are really becoming the they're like mega caps, really, really, really valuable companies, uh, technology companies, but also with a very high multiple. And one has to wonder how much of that is value and how much of that is uh, momentum trade. Bond yields or uh, long-term interest rates are on an uptrend. And as soon as we see uh, bond yields uh, higher and higher and higher, this could cause something to break. Why do I say that? Well, before we had a bond that was yielding 1.5%. Uh, stocks were yielding, let's say, 2.5%. So it made it was a no-brainer. Let's buy uh, bonds because let's buy stocks. I'm sorry. Let's buy stocks. They are yielding two and a half percent. 
their uh, dividend goes up through history. If I buy bonds, one and a half percent, you know, and uh, the interest goes down, goes up, the yields goes up, price goes down, I'm going to get hit with losses. So stocks was the only game in town, so to speak. Now, with the U.S. Treasury yield the 10-year yielding 3 percent, people are thinking, well, it's not such a bad idea maybe to buy bonds instead of stocks because I am getting a decent return, a decent income. Commodities, oil is uh, doing very well, we said, because extra supply is not so easy to find. We have those disruptions, but we have precious metals, industrial metals, soft commodities in the doldrums. Now, let's update on the previous uh, webinar. We had, uh, I have to say, the, there were some very good uh, calls, although you, you have to say that I'm, uh, maybe I'm biased because I'm talking about my own calls, but in April I had said that the dollar looked like bottoming out and rising yields may push it higher. Since then we had had 40 basis points uh, higher yields, so they went up to 0. Uh, they went up by 0.4% to around 2.9% from around 2.5%, and this led to a rally in the dollar. We also said that the euro was turning around and that the yen weakening. Uh, the yen was weakening because of the massive stimulus program. And those calls, I would like to um, to remain with those. What tricked us was the pound. The pound had risen. Uh, to the 142-143 level. Over there it showed some very strong technical patterns. So although the fundamentals were not so good for the pound, the technical picture for it looked uh, rather attractive. So there was momentum and it doesn't make a lot of sense to bet against the positive momentum uh, stories. So the pound, not that I was uh, positive on the pound, but I had to acknowledge that it was a very strong uh, performer. But we saw how quickly this turned and it continues to be uh, positive. Uh, it continues uh, to be under pressure, sorry, with this significant sell-off that we have seen in the pound. Now, going forward, I continue to believe that the extra Fed rate hikes should boost the dollar particularly if we get two more rate hikes. If we get one, well, it's not such a big deal, maybe, that's in the price, it's in, it has been priced in, but two, definitely something. Now, you must understand that the US dollar has built quite an interest rate spread versus the other majors, so it has become very attractive to hold because you are getting, you know, uh, you know, if you go for a 10-year uh, bond, you are getting 2.9% uh, interest in the dollar. If you are going for two-year, you are getting 2.5% interest. You cannot find such interest rates elsewhere in developed uh, currencies. They are either much, much lower, some are having even negative, so the dollar has a big advantage in terms of interest rates. This should be helpful for the dollar. Now, the euro has received a lot of selling, it has come down, but it's difficult to see what catalyst is going to turn around the euro. The ECB is not looking like it's going to become more hawkish. There are some political problems. The economy also, I don't see it picking up very much. So, I mean, yes, it has received a lot of selling, but it's difficult to see what is going to turn the euro around. Finally, uh, the pound is also uh, has a negative picture. We said that there is not a lot of clarity concerning Brexit, but I would also uh, note something interesting that the pound is tracking the euro rather closely. So if the euro is going down, the pound tends to go down as well. This is very interesting because, you know, you hear UK politicians, they want nothing to do, let's say, with the with the Eurozone, okay, I'm exaggerating here, they want a break from the EU, definitely, but we see that the pound and the Euro, they are fairly 
uh, trading fairly closely for now i'm saying i'm not saying that it's going to last forever but for now we see this pattern and it's uh, very interesting now the yen uh, we have a weak outlook if u.s treasury yields especially long-term rates push higher but the safe haven aspect makes uh, the yen a risky short uh, why do i say this i mean you may win uh, you know uh, collect you know 50 100 uh, pips on a trade uh, uh, short the yen but uh, one day if there's major turbulence in the market the yen could jump by 200 uh, dollar, dollar yen could drop by 200 pips very easily so this could uh, wipe out a lot of your gains so you have to be very careful when you're doing that i will be happy to answer any questions you may have you can visit our research page xm.com forward slash research you can visit and subscribe to our youtube channel and uh, thank you very very much now let's answer the first question is that whether it is uh, definite that the uh, bank of england is going to raise rates in the second half of the year as we said the market is giving a probability of around 70% of a second of August uh, increase. So we are expecting, I think that one more rate hike is going to happen uh, from the Bank of England. However, uh, I wouldn't be so sure that um, it's going to happen uh, immediately now. And furthermore, I wouldn't be so sure that it could be positive for the pound. Why do I say that? Because uh, if the Bank of England says, I am raising interest rates once more and I stop raising rates, then the, this is, uh, this could be even negative for the pound. Because what is really positive for currencies is a series, like an interest rate, uh, a series of interest rate hikes. One interest rates, the market doesn't care so much. But if there is, you know, a progression of rate hikes like the Fed, you know, it has been hiking rates again and again and again and again. So this is uh, leading to the substantial dollar strength. If a central bank raises once and says that's it, then uh, not a lot of gains. Now, would a trade war lead to, next question, would a trade war lead to currency war to offset the losses caused by the increased rate of the tariff hike being imposed by the US against the world. Yes, this could be, uh, the trade war could indeed lead to uh, a currency war. So uh, this, is, uh, this is something to watch. Because if the other countries, they start running out of options, of uh, tariffs, they may start to influence their currencies and this could be a very damaging escalation of the trade war. So we see there is now the, uh, the thought that China might lead to, might weaken the yuan on purpose. This could be a form of currency war. So it could further destabilize uh, the global now, uh, something else that I want to tell you is that if there is, uh, if any of you would like to receive the presentation in a PDF uh, format, uh, just uh, let me know in the question uh, in the question box, and uh, I will be more than happy to send the send the presentation uh, to you. Another question is with respect uh, to gold. When do we see uh, gold uh, bottoming out? It's very difficult to call a uh, bottom uh, for uh, gold. I think that it uh, could violate the 1200 mark, but uh, okay, long term maybe it will, uh, it will look attractive, but right now the negative momentum, we should be very careful uh, to call a bottom. 
Uh, one more question <coughs> about the Canadian uh, currency. Uh, Canada's, uh, the Canadian dollar is also under, uh, under pressure, as we showed at the beginning of the presentation, but uh, the, the issue for Canada is quite complex. We could get a rate hike, which is supportive of the loony. We see oil going higher, which is also supportive of the loony. On the other hand, we see uh, the Canada having a lot of exposure to the trade war uh, theme, and especially with its uh, NAFTA ties to the US. So if there isn't a smooth resolution of this, uh, of this uh, conflict, then it could be a big problem uh, for Canada. Hence, we see a lot of volatility in the Canadian dollar, but as long as this uh, trade war uh, theme is, uh, is uh, quite uh, vibrant, then we will, see the, we will see pressure on the Canadian dollar and maybe uh, a selling pressure as well. Now, for uh, Fed rate hikes, something uh, to note, the important points according to the market are probably September and December. So we are going to get a rate hike in September, most probably. This is more or less uh, baked in the cake, as we say, it's uh, highly likely. On the other hand, the, the big one, the big question is what is going to happen in December. And if we still get positive economic uh, news uh, out of the US. Global markets are not uh, rattled, let's say there is no global financial shock and this trade war uh, theme doesn't get out of hand, uh, then we could see another uh, <clears throat> rate hike. However, we have to say that it uh, has been uh, very interesting to watch uh, President Trump uh, becoming involved in the interest rate uh, debate uh, lately. So uh, this complicates matters that maybe the Fed is not going to be, it's not going to be as easy for the Fed to hike rates as it would have been without any political interference. I'm not going to, I'm not saying that Fed is no longer independent, but I'm just saying the political environment could be a little bit more messy and make it more difficult for the Fed uh, to uh, raise and maybe stop a little bit. Uh... Now, uh, the US dollar is gaining strength over the Euro, for sure. Uh, I see Euro USD breaking below 115. I know this is a risky call. Right now, it has been in this range between uh, 115 and 118.50 for euro dollar. Um, now, when that would happen, it's difficult to it's difficult to predict. Of course, you have to watch uh, these levels uh, on your own. Uh, but we, we are in this range, and whichever way the breakout occurs, uh, you may have to to trade it and. Um, like I said, I see that uh, the dollar is most likely going to gain strength over the euro. Of course, there are surprises. Of course, you have to manage uh, risk. It doesn't mean that uh, you know anything in uh, Forex is a one-way bet. And uh, of course, there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty over it. So I think we've uh, covered quite a lot of ground and I think we're also uh, close to one hour. So uh, thank you very, very much uh, for your attention. Um, uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and you found it uh, interesting. It was also a pleasure for me because uh, uh, it's a good opportunity to try to distill what is happening and try to give you the most important uh, insights and points of what is happening in the market action. 
and uh, hopefully uh, we uh, we will talk again in uh, in three months time to review another quarter until then i wish you all the best and uh, take care thank you very very much bye bye